wholeness and welcome. This is Josh Dippold from integratingpresence.com. Again, here for another talk. And this one's entitled, Ask for a Change. In the description I have here, let's play with the puns in this title to continue exploring a format change for the monthly Ask Us Anything show. So in three ways with this pun here, give and ask each other advice, two, needed changes individually and collectively, and three, continuing the themes of speaking up and inquiring, investigating to spark curiosity and enthusiasm. So let's just all take some deep breaths here and arrive, arrive in the room and just kind of settle in. So I invite and encourage you to maintain kind of a semi semi meditative state while we do this one where you can easily flow in and out of meditation so interaction remains possible so however you want to do that you're invited to do that so just be prepared here and this is going to be lots of questions so i'm going to read lots of questions like in the intro i mean address what's stated in the intro description with questions basically and you can easily engage with these questions or you can let them wash over you or anywhere in between. We may spend some moments contemplating and then responding to each of these and invite you all to comment on these. And if you're on Wisdom app, you can just chime in to join. And it's possible I'll put show notes up later so we can just keep with the flow of this. I know I like to kind of, if something really grabbed me, I just like to ignore everything else and just stay on that one question and just let the rest of the talk go by. But I mean, of course you're welcome to do that, but you can always come back later and address some of these questions and contemplate them more at your own time and leisure, leisure, however you want to say it. Okay, so this first one, giving and asking advice. So starting off, how do you give and ask advice? How do you actually go about this? And how often do you do this? So I'll put that off for now for me answering my own part of that. What are the upsides and downsides to both giving advice and receiving advice or asking for advice? Kind of the pros and cons when to and when not to ask for and give advice. So when should you do this? When should you not ask for and give advice? So if someone is asking for advice, but are there times where you know, I don't want to give advice or I don't have anything to offer being honest with something like that or referring to someone else, or maybe it's jumping the gun too soon. So let's just dig into the giving side, giving advice here with the questions. How honest are you when giving advice? You ever find yourself just blabbing out uh, advice when it's asked of you? It not really mattering how honest it is or not. Do your motives when giving advice change depending on the situation and person? And I would say for this one, Yes, obviously my motives can and do change depending on the situation, the person. If I'm reading a person, um, meaning just kind of gauging where they're at on their journey as far as my ability, um, and the same question would come from someone just starting out or someone f more further along in their path, well then of course the, the advice that I might give the person might be completely different even with the same question. Let's say they, those two people are asking the same question it might be quite different answers and also depends. Yeah. On the situation as well, what situations they're in. What about un unsolicited advice? Have you ever found yourself giving out advice that's not asked for? For me, this is a resounding yes, big time. And I learned the hard way on this I was joining certain groups at certain times and just offering advice. 
instead of just listening to the person and they weren't really asking for advice, just kind of sharing wisdom. And I know I've mentioned this in the past. That's what's great about Wisdom App. Yeah, there's always a choice. You can tune in or not, right? It's not someone barging in inappropriate situations saying things that aren't asked for. I still haven't broke myself completely of this. And here's one that's significant, I feel. Are we projecting our own wants and needs with our advice? If we're in the position of giving advice, someone comes to us, do we really take into account what needs to be done, said, or advised in that certain situation? Or, for me, just speaking here, or am I projecting my own agenda into it, right? Using it as an opportunity to further, uh, I wouldn't say my own agenda, but just any agenda, not forgetting maybe to state that as well. And then this next one, would I follow the same advice I'm giving? This goes along with past partner on the Ask Us Anything shows, Denny K. Mew. He put it like, do you eat your own dog food? So basically meaning, you know, you're giving out kind of dog food. I mean, it's kind of a way to look down on, but it's kind of humorous in a way too. If you're giving this out, are you eating it as well? So where is the advice coming from? Is it intuitive advice that you're giving? And how do you know it could be helpful? So is it just something we're parroting because we've heard it somewhere? Which is totally okay, but it just has extra oomph if we've actually put that in practice in our own lives and taken that advice for ourselves and then know the result for ourselves, whether or not it's helpful. So how else might we notice or know if some advice is helpful or not on the giving side when we're giving. And then this last one, what might be some overlooked key questions for the advice seeker that may help them discover the best views and choices for themselves? So like this, in a way, it just kind of, they might be telling you about a situation and the things they've considered and whatnot, but what are they overlooking? What are some things are overlooking and then asking questions around that. So it might actually seem like, or not just seem, but it might also actually just be that they come up with the correct advice that may or may not align with what you have in mind for them or what you advise, but just bringing some key questions to light that they might have, you know, passed over. Posing those questions to the advice seeker, then they could possibly come up with their own views and choices based on those questions that they just might have not been considering or just certain questions, framing them a different way, putting them a different way that they might have not encountered before. Okay. So now when asking for advice, are we asking for a confirmation or so basically do we already, have we already made up our choice and we're just kind of wanting to get validation, a confirmation of what we've already chosen, but we're asking advice anyway, which is totally okay. I feel it might be helpful to disclose that either before or after asking that. Or maybe someone's just asking advice for how possible choices might be perceived. Basically meaning, you know, well, I'm in this type of life situation. These are the possible choices. If I go and ask for advice, I'll get some feedback on how that person and maybe other people might perceive each of these possible choices. And then that goes along with the, what I just said about, well, I have, might have already made up my mind when going asking for advice anyway. I just want to kind of get feedback to see what people are thinking about this particular life situation, the choices I have available, and how they're going to look at these things or how people might look at these different choices available to me, how they might be perceived and viewed. So who do you go to when you're asking for advice? Do we have like some go-to people when we go to ask for advice? How do we go to them asking for advice? For me, it seems like I think it's dependent on the situation. So for me, I'll probably seek out certain expertise, maybe a certain specialist or a special expert, or at least it means someone who has maybe tailor-made for what I'm specifically asking about, asking for advice about. And then how we go about it. Um, 
I didn't put a lot of emphasis on this, but I know now that how we do and say things matters just as much, if not even more, than what we're actually asking. And for me, being more cognitive youngster, I just didn't understand what people didn't seem to be paying attention to the content of what I was saying, but the expression and the emotions behind it. Uh, and I know I've mentioned this before, it's really important, especially for those identifying more on an emotional level, maybe even higher refined heart-based level. Although people on that, not to put anybody down, but people that have kind of opened their heart and more on heart qualities and heart vibrational levels are going to be able to do all angles and more of however, whatever comes at them, right? not just based on emotional reactions and emotional likes and dislikes. Holding back, asking someone what you want to. So how many times do we find ourselves, just even outside of advice, asking to, holding back, asking someone you want to, I guess, what might be causing this? Maybe it's based on something very valid where it might stir up a bunch of stuff that doesn't need to be stirred up. It might cause more trouble than it's worth asking a particular person a particular thing. Or maybe um, you're headstrong and stubborn and rarely seek advice. Why is that? Or have you ever flipped the script testing someone by actually asking as something you think the advice giver themselves needs advice on? So it'd be like somebody coming in the chat room, which is cool to do, is saying, oh, hey, Josh. I think you, you know, what kind of, what color shirt is, um, should I wear today or something like this, right? Because maybe this color might not be going with the, the lighting or something like that, you know? I don't know, silly example. That's going to be about it on the advice thing, the seek, giving and seeking advice. So the second part of this is needed changes individually and collectively. So the core question here, I feel, or one of the core questions is, what really needs to change? So starting off with this, when hearing the word change, what comes to mind? Just spend a moment contemplating this. Without any kind of context or noticing the context the mind and heart goes to around the word change, what comes to mind and comes to the heart? When you take that word just by itself, change. Is there emotions coming up? Is there kind of like a flipping on and off, kind of vacillation between different standpoints and viewpoints? Is there memories coming up? Is there uh, changes in life coming up that need to be made? Changes that are putting off need to be made? So I would think if, if, if something was clear, kind of point out what context do you default to into when answering this question? Is it something like, I need to change? You need to change? By the way, how many relationships have we been in that have been taken on as projects? And I think probably most of you know what that means here, that it doesn't really based on so much love as much as, okay, well, I want to change this person or I can help this person, that type of thing, right? Going back to the context, or what about this context? I want to change, but I can't. Or yes, I know this change needs to be made, but making it's a reality that's far off, far off into the future. And for me, this one basically seems to be the default um, or a strong one. Because the change I want can't come quick enough. And the change I don't want, I don't want. So how do we discern between knowing what changes we need and what changes we just want? And that's one I it's hard for me to have an answer to a clear cut answer generally and specifically with that one. So maybe that's someone, something I need to sit with more and come back to that might have a little bit more to say on it with the rest of this, but we'll see. And will the changes we need happen anyway? Will the changes I need changes you need, will they happen anyway? I mean, that's possibly yeah one way to tell if it's needed, I guess actually, one possible way to see that is when things repeat in our lives, right? When we get constant repeating situations, themes in our lives, a lot of times that's an indicator of that we haven't learned what we need to learn yet. 
And while a lesson might keep repeating itself, a lot of times it, it won't be exactly in the same way, but there's a really common theme running throughout it. And I've mentioned this perception before, but instead of being like on a hamster wheel, what about if we were like climbing a spiral staircase? So every time we did repeat this kind of maybe needed change, we get a broader, wider, higher perspective on what keeps repeating itself. So how does all this apply on more collective levels? So how does all this apply on more collective levels, like with friends, ancestry, ancestry of past, present, and future? Maybe different tribes we're a part of or other tribes we associate with, different groups, collectives, organizations, humanity as a whole, and maybe even beyond humanity. So this just we'll just sum all those different groups up as the collective levels. So I just want to go back through those questions really briefly, and we'll consider them not just on an individual level, but on a collective level. So what really needs to change on a collective level? When hearing the word change, when it comes to a collective level, what comes to mind? What context do we default into when we think about needed change on a world level, societal level? For me, it seems to go back and forth between, oh, wow, this world needs a lot of change. There's a lot of stuff that could uh, be improved. I mean, that just seems pretty obvious, right? And then sometimes it's like, you know, why even bother? What effect this kind of hopelessness kind of thing or ineffectiveness or, you know, what can I do to help change the world? This kind of self-defeating attitude. And I would just respond to that as well with, well, everything you do, say, and even think matters. It all has its part to play. And there's the butterfly effect, and we're all interconnected. While it might not seem that important, everything that we think, say, and do does make a difference. And this, although it might be small, but those small things do add up drop by drop. The water pail is filled, right? A bucket is filled drop by drop, uh, especially when things are repeated or when there's, when collectively we come together, amplifies those things as well. Can the world change? Does the world need to change? How will we know? How do we know what these changes we want for the world are needed or just wanted? Will they happen anyway? And of course, this ties into really the only reliable constant in life is changeability, right? Inconstancy. So yes, the world is going to change and it always does. But how does that truth of reality align with or not align with the change we want for the world and the change we feel is needed for the world? So it's a kind of a balancing act that things change. Sometimes that change might not be very apparent. Sometimes it might be very small. Sometimes it might be very drastic. Sometimes it might uh, kind of repeat where it doesn't look like it's changing, but it is actually changing just a little bit. And there's all these different dynamics, right? With change, changeability, and constancy, and permanence. The third topic here continuing on the themes of speaking up and inquiring, investigating to spark curiosity and enthusiasm. So this goes to those who aren't speaking up and who are hardly ever assertive. These type of folks may be put off by someone like me who, especially in the past, is kind of overdoing speaking up. Uh, kind of a confession time here. You know, when I was like in high school, maybe even grade school, some of college, I guess, um, brief time at university or a few years at university. It's kind of stirring up stuff, kind of sensing that maybe what some of us being taught just wasn't on the level or, or just to be a troublemaker in general asking things, but more in the way that's not conducive, right? To, what we should be asking about. And probably people could have possibly groaned a little bit when I started doing this. Of course, though, it got some comic relief, but a lot of it was foolish, other than the fact that um, I could kind of sense something was off with 
possibly a lot of the things, although I did not know what that was or really how to go about it skillfully and wisely. I mean, as we all know, just coming up in a public schooling system in the United States, if any of you here have gone through that, uh, is quite the journey. I mean, adolescence is challenging enough just without any kind of overlay or any kind of interactions, although, you know, we can't get through life without that. And that's what actually makes a lot of it uh, so challenging. And then we have the folks who, who might lack establishing communicating and reinforcing boundaries. I think this word, this notion of boundaries, probably more emphasized now than assertiveness. Uh, it seemed like assertiveness might have been emphasized maybe 20 years ago, so more than boundaries, although boundaries some, but now we hear lots of talk about boundaries, establishing boundaries, communicating boundaries, and reinforcing boundaries. Possibly this is surrounding why people do and do not inquire and speak up, investigate and have enthusiasm or don't have enthusiasm. So this is something um, probably not going into here about how to do that. Uh, there's a lot of good people out there um, talking about boundaries, uh, making those boundaries, communicating and reinforcing boundaries. I would say also knowing when to dissolve certain boundaries or readjust boundaries or how permeable they should be. In fact, Lydia Grace, the gal that was who did a few months of these Ask Us Anythings with me and um, a couple with Denny, I think, she's really good on boundaries, teaching on boundaries, obviously. You can look her up. And of course, just a few past plugs on past work here. Mindfulness of speaking practice. You can find that on my website at the Paramita Challenge for December 2021. I'll link that in the show notes. But I'll go over some of the guidelines for right and wise speech. Maybe you've heard these or seen these before. The first one that's really big is tru uh, truthfulness, honesty and speaking. So is what you're saying true? Now, I guess some of these things can be made exceptions for if you're in joking, you know, comedy situations where it's obvious that the context is it's comedy. Um, although I even tend to shy away from some of this too, or make it, oh, I don't know how to say it, you know, might, if it's not true, kind of make it so absurd that it there's no question whether it's true or not. Like you're not going out to fool anybody without anybody you know, knowing about it or for the effect or coming in later and saying what you said and why you said it or why it wasn't quite 100% true um, for the effect that you, it was having. Some people might not know what's true or what's not. And that's, you know, that's a journey as well, a huge journey. So honesty, though, I feel everybody... Uh, or near everybody can tell what's honest and what's not, at least with themselves. And a lot of people just aren't even honest with themselves, which is a huge form of self-love, just being honest with ourselves. People talk about brutal honesty. And, you know, maybe there's a time and place for that. And there is. But the next one on right wise speech is kind. Is it kind? Especially lovingly kind, because truth is very hugely powerful. And, you know, we just look at this huge multi billion dollar industry of secrecy, certain levels of clearance, secret clearance, top secret clearance, above top secret clearance, yada yada. You know, some of it obviously is needed. I mean, we don't want people, anybody to just look up nuclear launch codes on the internet. I mean, that, I don't think that would serve anybody too well. But, you know, some of it is probably past its prime. Who knows why it's still being, maybe there's a reason, maybe there's not. But the point here being that truth can destroy the world you used to live in, right? It can be very devastating. The upside of devastation in relational context is it can reveal deep truth within us, though. So that helps when we're facing devastation in relationships. At least it has for me. Um, ideally, our speech should be kind as well. It shouldn't be harsh or divisive. Divide and conquer. If you live in the United States, this is a huge tactic for control, domination and control, is to divide people. Uh, it's just everywhere. Division on just about every issue. I mean, if anybody here is involved in politics, uh, first off, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, in a way, you know half kidding, but half, you know, not, because um, it seems to be a big emotional con game. Just about every political issue is 
if it's not already designed to divide people, it just, it seems to do it anyway. So how can we talk in a way that creates concord, brings people together, uh, promotes uh, unity, unification? Unity consciousness, I guess, is a hot buzzword now. I like it as well, most, most of the time, but anyway. Also, is what we're saying timely? I mean, is it, is it the right time? Like, you don't want to be yelling out silly jokes in the middle of a wedding ceremony, right? Silly example, or breaking into a dance party at a funeral. Also, is what we're saying helpful? Or is it just idle chatter, which small talk can be okay, especially when it need, needs to be said to put people at ease. Um, for a long time, I was like, well, this small talk thing is just a waste of time. And a lot of times it is. However, this is kind of a way to express love amongst people who kind of are still working on opening their heart too, right? A way of connecting and putting people at ease and kind of showing love without directly the intensity of being caring, open, honest, kind of loving, you know, kind, compassionate, rejoicing, things like this. Just the kind of small talk banter kind of thing. Also, last month's kind of Ask Us Anything entitled Ask Anyone Anything Live With Whom, Minor Ask Us Anything Restart. So in that one, I go into or I link to and go into why and why not to question and inquire and then um, read from my wisdom snippets, inquiry and investigation posts. So instead of rehashing that, I just link to that in the show notes. But what I didn't, I don't feel... I remember going into as much as how to actually f formulate questions when inquiring. A teacher of mine actually says to get the right answers, you have to ask the right questions. So one way of doing this is with a self-inquiry process, starting with just asking a question. And at first, it can be very vague in general, and then we contemplate upon it, and then a lot of times we'll at least get an answer. Sometimes we can sit it at a little more to just see if that answer is kind of all that there is. And then, then it, that answer will oftentimes present itself to be refined, right? Be, if you ask a vague and general question, a lot of times you'll get a vague and a general answer. So then we kind of get a better idea of refining that question more specific because it's not quite getting at what we wanted to. So you don't have to know exactly you know, what we're after, but kind of the answer we get back, then we can start narrowing it down, refining it, and then asking that question, sitting with it and contemplating and getting an answer, and then refining that and continue and repeat this. So what I found with this process is a lot of times we can get a very specific question that can kind of be the end of it. And then on the other end, can take this all the way to the end, but that's only kind of one level or layer of it, one angle to address whatever we're kind of after. And that's okay. It's also cool for me to be okay with not getting any answer, just asking the question or sometimes gauging, well, how much do we, when we do get that specific answer and it seems somewhat satisfying, but we know it's only one layer, um, how much time do we want to spend continuing with that same topic from other layers and other angles? And how much are we just going to say, okay, that's going to serve for now. You know, maybe there's also that thing We'll know exactly what we need to know exactly when we need to know it. And then there's peeling the onion technique. So peeling the onion, what's behind that, what's behind that, what's behind that. So when we're inquiring and investigating into things, can get the answer, and I've mentioned this technique before, and then we can just ask, well, what's behind that? Like a five-year-old asking why. Well, why? Getting an answer, why? And it's interesting to just keep peeling back layer by layer investigating that way. Okay, so now that some people might know on how to inquire and investigate and speak up and ask questions, what is the motivating factor behind this? How do we get motivated for speaking up and asking questions? Well, maybe one way I feel is, what are you really enthusiastic about? Or remember the last time you were really enthusiastic? Oops. <laughs> so let's just spend a um, moment or two recalling or enthusiasm. What do we get enthusiastic about or remember the last time about something? 
Maybe it is like a hobby that we do, something we really love doing. We get really enthusiastic about whatever hobbies we have, whatever we like to do on our time off, maybe social settings and friends that we get together with, juicy bits of things we talk about with other folks. Maybe it's service work. So whatever it was, what you're really enthusiastic about, see if we can come up with three things. So maybe two more things. Give a few moments here. And there's no rules on this. It can be something very abstract. It can be ideas. It can be emotions, whatever. Okay, so now how, how can this be applied to more areas? So this enthusiasm, just kind of feeling into what really lights us up, gets us going. We feel kind of energized around. A lot of people say excited and excited's okay. I just, uh, to me, that just kind of has like a nervous energy like uh, bubbling over and, and that's cool sometimes, but this enthusiasm I feel is kind of more grounded, sustainable, uplifting energy than uh, excited. So how can we apply this enthusiasm to more areas in our lives? And can the most enthusiastic thing we come up with can it be applied equally to these other two things we came up with? And maybe why or why not? And of course, this uh, question about, well, what all is really important to be curious and enthusiastic about? Maybe some of the reasons we're not having curiosity and enthusiasm is because maybe what we're curious and enthusiastic about isn't all really that important in the grand scheme of things. Either way, it's not a value judgment on what and what aren't, uh, you know, what our levels of curiosity and enthusiasm are about. Because there's a kind of opposite to this where maybe there does need to be a time for some of our old interests to fall away so we can rest and then reassess what we've once been interested in and enthusiastic about. I know for me, I was going through some really challenging times years ago. Some of the old interests I were, um, were in, they, they fell away for a while. Some of them died out completely, but other ones came back, but then I had a greater perspective, more wisdom, more curiosity in other angles of addressing the same topics. So kind of what I, the, the way I was approaching certain areas, the way I was doing that, the, the, you know, the way and the method and the approach that enthusiasm fell away, but I found a new way, other ways, wiser ways, skillful ways to approach these things. And the enthusiasm was not only rebuilt, but was better, was more, greater amount, greater degree of enthusiasm towards these new approaches. So who can you clearly ask and be curious around and not? Uh, maybe it's really obvious who we can be curious around and who is like, doesn't really have any patience for that, no desire, interest of curiosity, right? I mean, it's really easy to see in children, uh, a lot of children before the schooling system, I guess public schooling system, not that all public schooling systems are bad, but here in the States, it seems like for me at least, the curiosity was kind of beaten out of me, so to speak, obviously, and this was not beaten in school. <laughs> Although there was a paddle in grade school that I went to, but no one, I don't think anybody ever, it was used on, it was just kind of a weird psychological thing that was there, right? But anyway, you know, after a time that it was just kind of like this rote memorization and regurgitation. And so the natural curiosity just kind of fell to the wayside, had to kind of unlearn some things and then regain curiosity. So who all inhabits more of the gray areas also in life where sometimes I can be curious around them and ask questions and sometimes I can't? So this, this, remi this question reminded me of my niece and nephew who actually have this really cool thing they're doing now where they're saying, can I tell you something? So they, can, can I tell you something before they actually say it? So I was just like, wow, huh, it's a really kind of a good strategy. And I just tell them blanket that to, to me, you can say, you know, you can, I will tell you when it's not okay, right? I will say when well, you've gone too far, but other than that, you're open to just ask me and tell me anything, right? So they're young, they're both under 10, so. And then when are and when aren't good times to ask yourself questions and be curious, right? This might be a little more obvious when people are just stressed out and they just had it and they just need to, they or me too, right? Just need to recuperate and relax and it's not the good 
time to ask questions and be curious because of the energy levels not there or I just not feeling like it right now or it might be better I've designated this time to be curious or my curiosity goes along with this thing or these people so now go back through the takeaways so going back over this to the first part is there anything you can take away about the advice section so giving and receiving advice how might anything I've mentioned help um, when seeking advice or giving advice or actually not just me but we ask questions so anything that might have come up when considering those questions uh, and if there wasn't really enough time to contemplate them again I plan to include these notes in the show notes if not the audio too the second one about changes what changes need to be made on an individual level and on a collective level changes in general what's one thing you want to take away from that section on chain and then this last section about asking asking questions and being enthusiastic take away for asking enthusiasm well i guess with that may you all be blessed with an optimal ideal amount of energy and consciousness for the rest of your day evening night